All right, guys. Hey, I'm excited to be here. Again, my name is Paul McLean, and uh, myself and my beautiful wife, Natasha, and our, our tribe of five kids. I always say I, I don't love kids as much as I love my wife, you know what I mean? Um, but I got five kids, and, and uh, we're not just, you know, participants of God's house. No, we're members. We're a part of this house, this family. And uh, if there's no better house to be in than God's house Sunday morning at 10 a.m., you know, I was thinking as I was sitting there worshiping, like, man, I think when I go to heaven, I'm going to come back here on Sundays to worship. I mean, that's how good it was. And, uh, man, it's just good to be here with you guys. And I always count it as, a, as an honor and a privilege to bring the word of God. And I, my prayer is that, that he would use me as a conduit to, to get his word to you and that it would leave you differently than it found you. And um, if, you, if you woke up this morning and you were doing the gratitude journal, right, if you don't do that, I suggest you do, and you were struggling, like, what, do I, what am I grateful for this morning? I got something that I can give you. How about two people? Pastor Ryan Brennamer, that lead this church, that are committed to this church, that, that listen to the Word of God and adhere to the Word of God. So if we could put our hands together for Pastor Mariah and Pastor Brennamer. Well, I hope you're enjoying the summer in the Psalms. And uh, what a timely word, as it always seems like to me. It's always a timely word. And uh, God's really highlighted the last like eight weeks to me this, this verse, right? I don't know if you ever read the word of God and like that verse is just continuously highlighted. It's just like, it's just written on your heart. And this has been a, a verse that's been written on my heart the past eight, eight weeks. And, and this is a psalm that, that I believe a lot of you guys would know. In fact, I picked it also because I wanted you to feel confident where you could leave and say, man, I know the word of God. I knew that one. And so this is a familiar verse, but an impactful verse. It's Psalm 23. So if you want to open up your Bible to Psalm 23. Scripture says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all of my days, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Pray with me. Father God, we come to you, Lord, and I just ask that you open up our hearts and our minds, God, that the word that you specifically, intentionally prepared for each person in here, every individual in here, God, that it would, that it would be received, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see your word, God, to be able to go back and look at our life and see how this is applicable and how it applies to us, God, that we might leave better than it found us and that we could go out there and, and go through our valley moments, God, following you, choosing you as a shepherd in our life. In your name we pray, amen. Now, see guys, this scripture is written by King David, and this is years later. So he's already lived a long life. In fact, if you've, if you've gone through the psalm reading plan that Pastor Brand did not send out, which by the way, that was a test. Like, are you committed to the word or not? You know where Psalms is. Like, don't act like you need a like a crutch to be able to read it. But if, but if you've gone through the book of Psalms, you've seen these, these emotions, right? Like, like you've seen David in his highest points and his lowest moments, right? And you understand that this guy's seen some stuff. He's gone through some things, right? And I think about David, I think about um, my wife and, uh, and Pastor Mariah and, and my mother-in-law, Gina. It was a couple years back, they were talking about wrinkles, right? And uh, my mother-in-law was like, well, like my wrinkles tell my story, you know? And, uh, and I was like, I, I kind of like that, right? And then, uh, and then we ended up being in a Botox clinic, and they had, a, they had a sign that said, don't let wrinkles tell your story, you know? <laughs> so, you know, same message packaged differently to be able to apply to the individual that wants to objectively hear, right? But, um, but you know, when you look at David, you, you know that this guy, he has seen some things, man. And I thought about this. How many are thankful that we can open up the Word of God and we can read about some messed up people just like us that have gone through some valleys, that have gone through some things, that have figured some things out, and we can let their, their you know, hindsight be our foresight, right? That we can say, hey, I know where to step, how to step, what to do when I feel this way, because he did too, and I can see how he's gotten to the other side. And this is specifically what he did, how he did it, how he stepped, how he prayed, how he praised, and we have that in front of us to be able to do. And see, David is using this scripture as an analogy, right, between Jesus, the shepherd, and in us, the sheep. And see, David makes a declaration kind of like, like a question. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. Almost proposing like, the Lord is my shepherd. Who is your shepherd? Right? Because everyone has a shepherd. 
There's nobody that's been created by a, an almighty God, an all-sufficient God, to be dependent that was created that doesn't have a shepherd. So he's asking, my shepherd is God. Who's your shepherd? What's your shepherd? Because your shepherd could be, it could be you. You could be your own shepherd. It could be a person. It could be, it could be a career, right? It could be a substance. It could be food. It could be a website. It could be anxiety. It could be um, a storm, a struggle. It could be fear. It could be life happening to you. You're not happening to life. So he's saying, who, who is your shepherd? And see, we have a savior that says, I would like to be your shepherd. He says, hey, I've, I've, I've gone from eternity to earth. I, I, I was born at a humble birth. I lived a horrid death, was raised from the grave to bring you back into righteousness with my father. Would you like me to be your shepherd? And see, the second part of that statement, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. And then he says, I lack nothing. And you read that, I thought, like, like, how is that possible? How is that possible? And it's because of his shepherd. It's because of, of, of who he's dependent on. It's because of who's leading his life. The person that leads his life loves him, cares for him, has his best interests. The person that's leading his life, his ways are higher than, than your ways, and his thoughts are above David's thoughts. And, and so it's because he is his shepherd. The second part of that scripture says, he makes me, right there, that messes most people up, the whole makes me, right? I know it did for me, the control freaks, I ain't make me do nothing, dog. Like, so he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, the interesting thing about this is like sheep don't like to lie down. And there's, there's four reasons why sheep don't like to lie down. Number one is because they're timid creatures. So, so there's, if they're scared, they won't lay down, right? Now, because they're social animals, number two is they will not lie down if there's friction among the sheep, right? Like if there's sheep drama going on, like Betty sheep doesn't like Mary sheep or whatever, right? There's gossiping amongst the sheep. They don't want to lie down. Number three is, is if flies or parasites, like circumstances, pests, little annoyances are troubling them, they won't lie down. And then finally, number four is sheep are anxious. If they're anxious about their food or hungry, their basic survival needs, how am I going to you know, pay the bills, how am I gonna, then, then they also won't lie down. So after hearing that, how many of you believe that you're sitting next to a sheep, that your neighbor is a sheep, or at least some sheep tendencies, right? So the shepherd says, follow me and have rest. Lie down. Why? Why? Well, because he's dealt with the fear. He's dealt with the anxiety. He's dealt with the, the famine, and he's dealt with the pest, and he's dealt with the fear, and he's dealt with the anxiety. So he said, hey, if you're following me, lie down. Have some rest. I've dealt with those four things. I've handled those four things. I took those things to the cross. And for those that have the philosophy like, well, I live by the philosophy, do you. So I do me, dog. I do what I want to do. Well, that's fine. You just, you got a different shepherd. You just have a different shepherd. And you say, why would I want to do anything or follow anybody that's going to make me do something? Well, that's because he's got, he's got holes in his hands and in his feet and in his side. And he's got your best interest. That's why. And he says, the next script part of it says, he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Who would like, you know, who would, you, who would like to be refreshed, to be guided, to be led? And then David goes on to say, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. Your rod protects, your staff directs. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. See, I love David because he's got credibility to make these statements. Have you ever had somebody that, like, tries to give you advice and they got no credibility? It's like when somebody gives you parent advice. They're like, let me tell you how to take care of these kids. You're like, fool, you ain't even got no kids. I got five kids. I got five reasons to smack you for even trying to give me some, some feedback. You know, but, but like you'll have people that try to give you feedback or like financial help. And like, you're like, dude, I've seen where you like, what are you talking about? Like, but he's got credibility. See, he's running. He's been running from King Saul for seven years, hiding in caves. I don't know about you. I know you got some storms, but I don't think you crawled out of a cave to get here this morning. That makes sense. Like, like he's been hiding in caves for seven years. He was in enemy territory, right? Enemy territory. 
Goliath, you remember him? He killed Goliath. That, that squad, the Philistines, he was in that territory for 16 months. He was anointed king, and he had to wait 22 years patiently to actually become king. See, he had been anointed publicly as a king, but he had to privately go through a process that would produce the ability for him to actually be the king, that when he got the crown, the crown wouldn't crush him because he had to go through a process to develop himself. So he had gone through some stuff. And see, David can look back and see all those dark valley moments, those battles, those times of great anguish and fear and anxiety, and he can see that in those valley moments, even though he was scared, he was being prepared for the promises on the other side of that struggle. And so the title of today's message for all you guys that are taking notes, and just so you know, statistically proven, it's just stats, you're li- more likely to have a blessed life if you take notes. So if you're like, that's, that's one for you, right? But the title of today's message is Scared But Prepared. See, David had learned that the good shepherd had prepared a table before him in the presence of his enemies. What he didn't say is that the good shepherd removed him from the enemies and removed him from the battle. He didn't say that. See, God will mostly deliver you in the storm before he will deliver you out of the storm. When you look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right, you know, these are some courageous guys. And uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is like, hey, you got to bow, you're going to do what I say. And, and they're kind of like, man, listen, if we, if we bow for everything, we'll stand for nothing. We ain't going, we ain't listening to that. And they stood on the rock, they stood on God's faithfulness, and they said, listen, even if, like, we're not, we're not going to bow. We're not going to bow. And see, the thing is this, God never actually got them out of that furnace. They were thrown in, and, and the good shepherd went into the furnace with them, prepared a table with them. And like, what we would like is like, magic wand god you know what i'm saying like i got faith i got faith for five seconds meaning they're like i'm like god deliver me from the furnace i look up he didn't deliver me it didn't work i don't know if i could trust no no you don't know the process the ways the thought so so we would like to have magic wand god but but we don't serve a magic wand god we serve a god that's got your best interest that loves and cares and wants to comfort you wants to lead you guide you direct you as you go through the storms of life because he knows what's on the other side and so he, he never actually got them out of the furnace. The one that threw them in the furnace pulled them out of the furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar was like, dude, like, I know those boys are talking all that smack about they ain't going to bow down, and they, they look brave, but I thought that would go away when they, you know, when they turn into ashes and stuff. But now they're walking around, and I see a fourth person. And he's like, dude, like, get them out. And he, the one that threw them into the furnace, man, he pulled them out of the furnace. He pulled them out. So you would think that God would prepare a table for you in his presence, the presence before God. But see, God brings his presence down to the table in the presence of your enemies. And see, there's two, there's two chairs at this table. There's one for you, and there's one for your shepherd. And why is that good news? Why is that good news? Because if it's not a marriage battle, if it's not your kids went crazy, if it's not a financial stress or disaster or weight that you're holding on to, if it's none of those things, if it's not an illness or a disease that you're going through, if it's none of those things, there's a spiritual war, a spiritual battle that's going all around us. It's light versus darkness. It's kingdom versus world. And it's creating a lot of friction. And see, Peter, 1 Peter 5.8 it kind of talks about this. It, Peter says, listen, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And all he's looking for is just a small little crack or crevice where he can kind of get in. Now, how does he do that? Well, a couple of ways. One is doubt, right? Doubt. If you've, if you've heard these things before, these things of like, Like, you really think you're going to succeed at that? You really think you could do that? I think you might fail. In fact, I don't think you're going to make it through this. Have you ever heard that? That's the enemy trying to sneak in in a crack or, or a crevice. Can you really trust God? 
you're going to embarrass yourself, and you're going to embarrass your family when you fail. You really think your marriage could turn around? Like you think so? All those years of those words said, all the resentment that's been built up, you, think, you really think that's going to happen? You think, you think that's going to take place? Do you think you're going to get out of that financial debt that you've got over you? Or do you think it's probably, probably going to get worse? That illness, that sickness, that disease that you've got, you really think it's just going to be lifted from you? Like, think about all the years that you've, you've had it. Come on, seriously? See, that's how he does it. He comes in and he causes a seed of doubt with that voice, right? That seed of doubt. He does it another way by distorting. So he uses the, the art of distortion. And he'll get a lie that looks close to the truth. And you'll go to work finding evidence to make it true. And if a lie you believe is true, it'll f- affect you as if, it is in the, as if it is. So he'll do that by distortion. Lies about who you are and your identity. He'll say things like, you're not good enough. You're a failure. Look at all the times that you failed. And you're just a bad parent. Just what you are. You really, in fact, you really just don't matter that much. You're really just insignificant. He'll get you to believe these lies. Not the truth, the lies. He'll do it also by, by getting you to believe that everybody's out to get you, right? He'll say, like, people don't like you. Nobody at school likes you. Nobody at work likes you. People are all out to get you. They're all against you. They're all out to get you. And then you'll, you'll walk into work the next day, and, uh, you know, Larry, Larry doesn't even look up from his laptop. And you're thinking, like, Larry hates me. He, he hates me. Everybody hates me. And then sure enough, you'll go into work the next day, and Larry doesn't even look up from his laptop. You're like, see? I knew it. He hates me. This whole department hates me. Look at them all over there, hating me. And what you didn't realize is that, that Larry was just checking his dang Excel spreadsheet. But your mind will go to work making something true. See, what did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say? They said, even if God doesn't keep me from this furnace, even if God is still good, God is still faithful, his promises are yes and amen. That he will do exceedingly abundantly more than what we ask or think or imagine. Like, we can't see it, but we believe in a God that even when we don't see it or we don't feel it, he's still working. Even when we don't see the way, we know we, we serve a way maker. So we don't have to see the whole, the whole picture. We serve this moment. In our moment right now, we're lifting up God and giving him glory because we know that the picture ends in victory. So even if, even if we're still going to serve him. You think about this this time where you where you see um, you see David as a kid, and you got Goliath right. He's he's mocking the entire you know the, the the whole army of Israel, the entire trained army of Israel. You got Goliath. He's mocking them right, and then you got a kid. He ain't no trained. He's not a, he's not an adult. He's not a trained soldier. You got a kid that comes and says, "Who is this uncircumcised Philistine?" Which, that's like cuss words. Like, nowadays, I'd be like, who's this beep? You know what I mean? Like, that's like throwing some words. Like, that's covenant talk. Like, who's this uncircumcised dude? You know? So, <laughs> and then guess what he did? He, he, he didn't just say it. While, while the entire army of Israel was retreating, what did he do? He stepped up. So while they were all stepping back, he stepped up. And that step that he took in faith caused the giant to fall. And see, the enemy wasn't even after David, and the enemy's not after you. I've heard people like, man, the enemy's after you. The enemy's after me. And the enemy's not after you. The enemy's after your father. Anybody that that has children understands what I'm going to say here. When something happens to your child, you think, man, yeah, it, 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 it it hurt her. But man, it really, it really hurt me. He's after, he's after the father. Why? 
because, because you know everything that you've prayed for. You know the, the purpose for your child. You know the promises over your child. You know what they're capable of. You know what you, the future and the hope that you've declared. You know those things. And so the enemy is really after, he's really after your father. He's not saying, like, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you, you know, Aaron. He's not doing that. <laughs> he's after your father. And see, what we got to do is when we hear those words of doubt or distortion, we're all going to hear those, those words. But what we got to do in that moment is, is, is replace those words with the truth. We take every, every thought and bring it captive under the obedience of Christ. Like We say, okay, this isn't what the word of God says. This must be from the liar because a shepherd doesn't believe this about me. So, so we take it all captive. So the moment you hear it, you rebuke it, you, you replace it with the truth. So if you hear, I'm not enough, you say, no, that's not the truth. The truth is I'm more than enough, not because of what I've done, but because of what he's done. I know I'm not moved by what I feel in this moment from what I'm hearing in my mind. I'm moved by the facts that, that God is good and he's faithful and his character and his nature is good. See, the moment you take what you're hearing and then you believe it, that's the moment that the enemy just slowly was pulling out your chair, very slowly. But the moment you believe him is the moment that you let the enemy take a seat at your table. And you might not even realize it, but you just let a killer have a seat at your table. So how do we handle these valley moments? I'm going to give you guys five quick points on how to handle these valley moments. These are table behaviors. When you got a table prepared before you, this is the table behavior. So the first one is to walk by faith, not by feelings. See, we're not, we're not going to be walked by what we see, we got to walk by what he said. Not by feelings, but by those facts that we serve an undefeated shepherd. And that you might be delivered from fear, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to feel fear. You're going to still feel it. And to give you a great picture of this, I love the scripture when, you, when you've got Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he was to be crucified. So if you look at Matthew 26, 38 through 39, then Jesus said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. See, in this scripture, I, I, don't, I don't know if there's ever a, a time in the Bible where Jesus has become so relatable. He wants to quit. It's right before the great breakthrough, and he's just to the point where he's, he's crying blood, is the way it, it translates. Just, just anguish that is hard to even fathom. I don't know if you've ever been there where you're just overwhelmed with sorrow. And you're like, just take this cup from me. Take this pain from me. But Jesus said, even if you don't, maybe your will, as you will, not as I. And Jesus goes on to say, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In essence, he knows when, if he sees as the spirit, as he goes into to prayer with God, that, that the breakthrough's coming, that the race that's before him is worth the finish line. But in the flesh, he feels the fear, the anxiety, the stress. He feels what the moment's bringing. And see, this has taken place in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Gethsemane is translated into as, as oil press. And oil is symbolic for the Holy Spirit. And see, oil can be in, used for anointing. Um, and, and so if you think about this, you've got the anointed one, Jesus, the anointed one, in the oil pr press. And see, in order for oil to be produced, there's a crushing that has to take place. So you've got the, the, the anointed one in the oil press going through a crushing because he's getting ready to be anointed to a different level. And I wonder of how many in here you've quit right before the next anointing. 
You've quit right before your next breakthrough. You've quit right before the next promised land. On the other side, God's got so much good in store for you. And it's okay to feel like you're quitting. It's okay to feel that. Because the good news is, so did Jesus. It doesn't make you bad. And see, it was right before the greatest purpose ever was to be fulfilled. And maybe your greatest purpose is on the other side of the greatest pain, and a pain has clouded your vision to be able to see that the waymaker is at work. See, if you've ever felt like that weight has been so great, just take courage. On the other side, there's a different level of freedom, a different level of character, a different level of discipline, a different level of recovery, a different level of impact. And so even though you're scared, God is preparing you for new levels. And how many can testify that as you got deeper into that dark valley, as you got deeper into that dark valley, that God got closer, that peace got closer, that love got closer, that comfort got closer. See, resistance doesn't mean God isn't in it. It means the enemy is scared of who you're about to be on the other side of that struggle. See, I have, I have a two-year-old little, little dude. My son's name's Psalm. This entire series was actually named after him. Um, he, he likes to drive, right? So he likes to drive the boat. Um, in fact, yesterday he was the captain of the boat. Um, he likes to drive golf cart. He likes to drive mom's car. He likes to drive my car. And I thought about this. Like, that's, like we have to handle fear like you would handle a two-year-old that wants to drive. See, see, fear wants to drive. You can't let it drive. You can let it ride. You can let it ride. It's going to ride. But you can't let it drive. In fact, you, you got you to gotta put it in the, 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 the seatbelt that's got the over the head. You know, like you got to make sure that thing is harnessed in. That's what you got to do with fear. Because it can ride, but it can't drive. And what you can't do either is you just can't stuff your two-year-old in your trunk. Because you're going to end up in prison. And it's the same thing with fear. You can't just stuff it down because it's going to lead you to an internal prison. See, you could have the feeling, but the feeling doesn't have to have you. See, Jesus, when he felt the fear, what did he do? His whole life is an example of when we go through those things, exactly what we should do. It's the answer. He fell down, and he prayed to God. Now, he didn't just do it one time. He had the fear. He prayed to God, and then, and then he went back, checked on the disciples. They were all sleeping, a bunch of winners he chose. And then he went back, prayed to God, and, and, and felt it again. And then he went back a third time. Sometimes we're like, well, I prayed, and, and it's still here. Well, maybe it's because you've got to build that prayer muscle. Maybe you've got to build that faith muscle. Maybe you've got to keep pushing through. And then once he got done with the third prayer, he said, all right, arise, let's go. Time to go out there and fulfill my mission and purpose and push through the pain that's before me. See, David in a valley moment, looking at another valley moment for David, he's running from Saul, and he goes to Gath. Now, Gath is a place where he defeated his first giant. And, and Scripture says that he was afraid because they noticed him. So he was scared because they noticed him. How many know that your enemy will notice you. He already had a victory. And so, so they had noticed him, and his scripture says he was very much afraid, scared of the king A, because I don't even know how to say that word, of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Now, this isn't for Samuel, if you look at Psalm 34, Psalm 34 is actually describing this moment as well. And it says, when David pretended to be insane, the t okay, so listen, the title of Psalm 34 is, when David pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. And it says, with saliva dripping down his beard, Scripture says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. So, so what did King David feel? The enemy was prowling like a, a roaring lion. His mind was going crazy. Like, what if this happens? What if that happens, right? 
he was going nuts. Like so much so that he had saliva running down his beard like a crazy man. I thought maybe I would illustrate this for you guys, and God said, don't do it. Let them use their imagination. But he locked eyes with the good shepherd. And see, this is unsightly praise. This is unsightly praise. This is that the same Psalm 34, that same Psalm, when he's, when he's acting like a madman, David says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. See, David wasn't, David wasn't listening to himself. He was talking to himself. He wasn't listening to his feelings. He was acting like a wild man, right? Crazy. But he was extolling the Lord. He was giving him praise even though he felt that way. So he didn't feel it. He faithed it. See, I may have fear, but I'm not going to have the fear have me. I will still lift up a praise. I will still thank God for his faithfulness endures forever. When I am faithless, he's still faithful. So I got a call. Um, it, was, it was the last day of school, uh, probably eight weeks ago. And um, if you know me, I kind of just don't think nothing's a big deal. My gift. I'm <laughs> just like, whatever, you know. Um, but well, we were driving back from the last day. It was a great day. In fact, I think some of you were there. It was, it was the last day. A lot of you have kids that go to the same schools as, as my daughters go. And um, we got a call. My, my wife actually answered the call, and, and it was a doctor. And he says, hey, you got to come in and, uh, and see me. And so I'm like, and my wife kind of looks a little, you know, anxious about it. And I'm like, it'll be fine. It's not a big deal, you know, because she had just had a chest X-ray. And so we went to see the doctor, and we, we were literally – in the car ride leaving school. We were two minutes on a ride, and, and Parker actually had her, her, her best friend Claire with her. Um, and she's like, Dad, I, you know, she told my wife, like, I just want to have just an unbelievable summer. I mean, they were just excited. You imagine, like, the last day of school. So we go to the doctor's office, and, and the doctor says, hey, you got to go to Loma Linda. I'm like, okay, we'll go, like, on Monday. He's like, you got to go right now. I was like, all right, probably no big deal. He's over-exaggerating. Um, and I remember going down to Loma Linda, and she got an X-ray. And I was, I was in the parking lot, I was talking to my best friend, Andrew, and uh, just like no big deal. And he's like, dude, how do you, how do you have, how do you have that peace? So, man, I just, I mean, I, I see God every, every morning, you know, like, I pray, I read, I read the word. I mean, it's, it's definitely him, it ain't, it ain't on my accord, and that's, a, you know, I just, I think I build the faith that way. And um, we went back in, and in and, and the x-ray the x-ray came back, and the doctor said, you know, news that nobody ever wants to hear. He said, your daughter has cancer. And I remember that moment, I felt so faithless for the first time in my entire life. And the next, that night, we ended up going, and, and the news didn't get better. Um, the doctors thought it could be. Uh, a worse kind of cancer. They said maybe it's bone cancer, it's kidney, and just the reports didn't get better. It was almost like a compound of the exact result that you would not want. And and if you know me, like I can sleep through anything. You know, what I mean, like I can. I I've never had a hard time sleeping. I see Andrew. I'll sleep on an airplane. I'll sleep anywhere. I'll sleep standing up. <laughs> like I can sleep. Um. And that was the first time in my entire life I did not sleep at all. And I sat there filled with fear, anxiety. And, and, I, and I, what I did was I got back to what I had done before. It wasn't, it wasn't glorious praise. It was unsightly praise. And my wife and myself, we just put hands on her as she slept. And we listened to worship music and we just praised God that there was going to be good. We praise God that he would deliver her. We praise God that he's in it. We praise God that he's still good and he's still faithful. And that we're not going to trust in the feelings, but we're going to, we're going to rely on our faith. And the fact that he protects me. He protects my family. That he provides for me. He leads me. He guides me. He restores me. He directs me. That he's the great physician. We went to the table that God had prepared 
before us in the presence of that enemy. See, in the darkest valley, we got to go to the table that the good shepherd has prepared for us with praise and worship. So point two is praise and worship. We go to the table, we deal with valley moments with praise and worship. See, when you enter a state of worship and praise, it bursts gratitude. And when you combine that with faith, even science says that your DNA will start to shift and change. What God says is that that new creation is coming out, that you're becoming more of that new creation that he's created you to be. He says, enter my gates with thanksgiving and my courts with praise. He's called you to lift up a hallelujah. He's called you to bless his name in the midst of a storm. And see, I love us this story with Paul and Silas. See, Paul and Silas, and, and if you look at Acts 16, 25, you know, they, they had been beaten, right, and thrown into prison. And it says severely beaten. This isn't like when I went to high school, I'd have a guy be like, dude, I whooped that dude. Like, I beat him, man. I'm like, I saw him, dude. He had a scratch on his face. Like, I don't think you beat him, right? Paul and Silas, they, they had been beaten almost to death, right? And they got imprisoned for doing good. What was the response? See, nothing could keep them from praising and glorifying God. It says, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. See, when you lift up a hallelujah, when you open your mouth and lift up the word of God, that which demolishes strongholds, addictions, bad beliefs, false identities, that which can be shaken will be shaken, so that which cannot be shaken will remain. And that's exactly what took place here. Scripture says, immediately the doors were opened, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and was going to kill himself, and he thought the prisoners had escaped. And Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. See, the earthquake happened, and that event happened, and it would eventually lead to their freedom. But it, it didn't lead to their freedom right then. It didn't, it didn't lead to the freedom that we would have expected it would have led to, where they just walk out of the door that was just broken open for them, they're, they're changed loose. But, but it, did, it did three things. One, that earthquake that opened the doors and loosed the chains, what it did was it served to remind Paul and Silas that God is with them. Man, I could tell you there's been so many signs and miracles and wonders that have taken place every day since eight weeks ago, where God is saying, I'm still there with you. I'm in there with you. Just keep trusting me. Stay at my table. It was just served to remind them that, yes, you were in prison, but prison does not have to get into you. The second thing was to reveal to the other prisoners that there's a better shepherd. Like, whatever you've been following that led you here, let me just tell you, brother, there's a better shepherd. There's a good shepherd that's got protection, provision, that's got freedom for whatever you've done that can, can rid your shame and your guilt, it was to remind the other prisoners and to show that these two men, they didn't do and respond and act and behave like all the other prisoners. They were salt and light in the darkest moments. They still praised God. The third thing was to, to save the jailer, the jailer's life, not just to save his life, but to save his eternal life and his family's eternal life. The fact, the act of love that Paul and Silas had by not his not just escaping because they thought of this one guy. They wanted to make sure his life wasn't going to be taken because of what would happen when you let prisoners escape. So, so they remained. And that act of love, man, it shines so bright that the jailer's like, what's going on here? He leaned in and got close to them because of how close they were to God. And, and then it says in Scripture that he brought Paul and Silas to his house, and the jailer and his entire family, the entire household, accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, as their shepherd. See, sometimes in your darkest moments, your darkest valleys, God is using that valley to give others victory. He's using that valley to give others freedom from the death of sin, from addiction, from bondage. He's using that victory for their benefit. He's using that situation valley for their, their victory, to give them peace, to give them rest. Point number three is rest. How do we handle valley moments? We rest. Matthew 8, 24 says, Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleep, sleeping. The disciples went, and they woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, You have little faith. Why are you so 
scared? Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. So when you read this at first, I think, like, that's kind of annoying. Like, have you ever been there? Like, Jesus, what's up, man? Like, why, why are you letting me in this storm? Why don't you just, like, what's going on? Why am I going through this storm? And so at first, it's annoying, but I think as you start to understand it, it goes from annoyance to encouragement. Because how many are encouraged that Jesus is not panicked by your situation? Jesus is not scared about your circumstances. That he sleeps while you're going through everything. He's at rest knowing that he understands he's the beginning and the end. So even though you're in the middle, he knows what's going to end. And he's at rest because he sees the victory before you. And see, I remember a couple years ago, um, I was on the boat. We had a deck boat at this time. And uh, I had the whole family in the boat. Peyton and Zeta um, were were the front of the boat. They had bear. This is before we gave our dog up for adoption. We still had him. And um, I, I was I was going like two miles an hour, right? And and it was kind of windy, but not really. It was it was windy, but there was no boats out there. So all the waves on the lake were wind waves, and it's a lake, so you get a, you get, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it wasn't that bad. But I'm slowing down. I'm going like two and a half miles an hour. Zeta and Peyton fall into the lake. Now, mind you, they're 13. They've been swimming since they were six. You know what I mean? Like they don't swim. So they fall in the lake. My wife never really goes on the boat that much with us. And so she's like, oh, my God, they're going to die. So she's like, this, this is it. So she's freaking, she starts freaking out. And all of a sudden, because I got a bunch of girls, guess what they do? They start freaking out. Now I'm like, what in the world? Like, I feel like I'm in Titanic and I got to save everybody. You know what I mean? I'm just imagining, like, there's probably people on the dock, like, like looking like, what? Like, everybody's pacing, running, like, ah, and like. They just see two teenagers swimming. Um, like there's a shark or something. There's got to be a shark in the lake. Now, somebody brought a shark from, it's a freshwater shark, and it's in our lake. Um, and so I ended up getting the girls, and, uh, and, and Bear almost did die because <laughs> the waves were about this, and he's this. So, like, it was close. And by the way, I got no help because how many know when you're scared, you have no strategy? Which I could preach. So, so. So I have to, like, go around with the boat and then jump over, grab him, pick him up, and I save Bear's life. I'm a hero. Um, no big deal. So, but how many, are, how many are excited and appreciative and encouraged by the fact that, that Jesus is not panicked by anything? He's not panicked. See, the only way you lose your peace is if you give up a seat at your table to the enemy. No storm is going to surprise God. He's not up in heaven thinking like, this is a big one. I don't, I don't know. He's not thinking that. It doesn't surprise him. And then you can look at the story and, and think like, man, but like, think like Jesus, like this dude, he's the storm sleeper, bro. Like he, that's epic. Like I don't have faith like that. How does he have so much faith? And see, if if you if you need faith when it's required, like if you don't, see, faith, you have to have faith before you need faith. You understand what I'm saying? You have to have faith before you need faith. If, if, you, if you are looking to have faith when something crazy is going on, that's foxhole faith. That ain't real faith. The bullet's already flying by your face, dude. And you're like, all right, I, I, I'm going to. See, faith is something that you got to do daily. It's a daily practice. So when the storm has come, you know how to chart your waves. You know how, you know how to chart the course. And I love the story in Job, too. So in the story of Job, you got the devil, and the devil has to come report to God, which I think that's just cool in itself. So, so God's like, where you been, devil? That's, that's the question, Job. Where you been? The devil's like, I've been, I've been to and from, scanning, going back and forth across the, 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 the planet, right? And, and the devil's saying he's, he's been busy, right? See, demonic, the, the demons, there's no rest. They're tormented constantly. They get no break. They get no rest. And they're jealous of the gift that you have by having the rest that Jesus provides. But if you look at the devil and demons, they're always constantly moving in that work. There's never a point of rest. And think about the sequence, our intentional God, the way he created heavens and earth and he created you. We were created, and our first day was what? 
a day of rest. See, a lot of times people think, man, I, I'm going to go hustle. I'm going to go work so I can rest. And God, the good shepherd's like, you got to mix up, dude. You rest so you can work. And rest isn't a nap. Rest is stopping and, and getting God into view so you can go and look at the one that created heavens and earth and that is the Alpha and the Omega and that has everything in control in his hands. That's what rest is. So how do you fight your valley moments? You got you to gotta rest. See, anytime I, I would think about that day, and I believe God wants to give you rest from, from past memories that you've tied emotions to that are not healthy, but every time you go back to that memory, that emotion of fear, of grief, of stress, of anxiety, it's, pro, it's, it's just forecasted into the future. And then you start to repeat the same behaviors in different ways because you're living by the memories of the past that are produced from the emotions of you going there. And I believe that God wants to rewire all the past memories that are producing the feelings that are not of him, that are not of his will. And I, I, I think about every time... I would go and think about that day, the last day of school where we got the news. It would just fill me with anger, um, sorrow. And see, but as I've spent time at the table that, that God's prepared before me in the presence of the enemies, as I've, as I've sat there, God has gone back and he's shown the good that he's working out already how unified our family is, the things he was doing even before, like the fact that, that a week before, me and Parker went to a Lakers game, and, and I was telling my wife, she's like, you're going to spend that kind of money on those kind of seats, and you're going to go stay there? I'm like, I don't know. I just feel like in my spirit, like I want to. It didn't make any sense. I was going to do it and wasn't going to do it, and um, I've done daddy-daughter dates, but I've never had like a daddy-daughter like experience or trip, and that was like the, one of the first ones, and, and, I, and I took Parker down to uh, the Lakers game where they played and they beat the Warriors because they're better than the Warriors. Um, if you're from Golden State, that might be part of your issues that you have. Well, um, but but we we went and and we spent that that, that t and it was it was the most incredible day I've ever had with her. We went and got dinner. We had great seats and the videos. If you see her face, and we didn't know what was going on. We had no clue. This was before everything. But guess who knew? God knew. He, knew. he knew the mountain that was before us. He knew the mountain that was before Parker. And he, and he, and he gave us that utterance and nudge as I went to him. And, and he showed me all the good. So now that as I go back to that day, that moment that produces so much pain, I'm learning to reprogram that to an emotion that proclaims victory, that proclaims his goodness, his faithfulness. So as I go back, I won't be shifted and moved by fear, anxiety, but freedom. And I believe God wants you to do that. That yes, you know, what the devil meant to hurt you, God meant to deliver you. You might be scared, but he's prepared that table before you. Number four is get faith-filled people at your table. So in Exodus, it says, so Joshua fought the, Am the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held his hands up, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it underneath him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other, so that as his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, Amalekite something, army, Brian, what does he say, dude? <laughs> All right, whatever. He, I, I got a lot of A words that I can't pronounce, so we're going to say he, he overcame the A army with his sword. But see, you know, there's going to be some, some times in these dark valley moments where, man, you're going to become tired emotionally, mentally, physically. Your eyes, your ear, you're going you're to drift from the shepherd that's sitting at that table with you. And you're going to want a couple errands and a couple hers, man, that can get around you and remind you of what God says. That reminds you of who you are. That reminds you of your identity. You're going to want a couple of them. What he spoke about you, that, that when you're getting ready to fall back into your old ways, your old patterns, they say, hey, man, come on, dude. 
Look how far you've come. Look how, God, how good God's been. You're going to want some Aaron and some hers that can speak life into you, that can remind you of the vision that God's got before you. See, I was walking through. It was, it was a couple years ago. I was in Cleveland doing a meeting, and um, I had dinner with some agents, and I was, I was walking back, which I don't know why I was walking back to the hotel. I think it was right on the street, but I was walking down this dark alley by myself in a suit, dark alley, and, and, and there may or may not have been multiple different gangs in these alleys that were staring at me, and I was like, what the heck, man? Like, I, I, I was scared. Like, this could be it. Like, I was, do I ping my wife, let her know? Do I send, like, a, a recording, and then she gets it later? Like, what do we do? Um, but I thought, like, man, if, if I was walking through this dark alley, and I had, like, fully equipped Navy SEALs, would I still be scared? No. I'd probably, you know me, I'd probably instigate. Like, you looking at me, dog? What's up? Now, now, <laughs> Not because of my ability to fight, but because of who I got with me. See, see, and sometimes you just need some faith-filled people, man, to get around you. That, that, because, hey, listen, our weapons of our, our world are not carnal, right? It, it, but they're mighty in God pulling down these strongholds. And so we just need some people that, that are Navy SEALs in the Word of God that can come around and say, hey, listen, I know you're not, I know you're worried. I know you can't see it, but let me remind you of some things. I've got some faith. You could borrow some of mine. And see, I was, I was flying, I had, a, I had a trip this last week, and I was flying back, and um, <laughs> I had, the, 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 I talked to Pastor Brian, he's like, this is going to make you seem bougie, dude. I'm like, whatever, it's like God told me to say it, all right? So I'm, fly, I'm flying back, and, and I was going to just fly economy, all right? Because my wife likes white oak cabinets, and we're remodeling the house, so I'm like, I got to go economy, you know? Everything's white oak in our house now. It ain't the same. So, so I'm, I'm going to go economy. And then United Airlines, for whatever reason, I thought I chose my seat. They gave me 20, 21B, right? And how many know, like, B's middle? That's a middle seat. And, and I had not prepared for this message, right? This is Wednesday or Thursday. And, 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 and I'm like, I'm going to prepare for, for all these hours on this flight. And how many know you can't prepare for a message when you're sitting in the middle seat? Because you don't know the enemies might be sitting around you. You're like, you don't know if they're going to snore, take your armrest, like you got no space. I'm like, the heck? This is, God, this is the enemy trying to attack me, trying to keep me from preparing what I need to prepare. I'm like, he ain't got nothing on me. You know, my freedom's worth $500 upgrade. So I upgraded, you know, I upgraded to, to business class. And uh, I'm sitting there. And uh, I got, I'm the honest to God, I got all, and it, we haven't even taken off yet. And I'm like, I got to get on this. So I, I got my stuff out before the stewardess says you could open. I don't care. Like, I, I got my stuff prepared. I got, I got space, you know. And uh, I noticed out of the corner of my eye, this lady um, that, that's crying. And I'm like, is she crying? And so I'm trying not to look. I'm just being honest with you guys. Like, this is, you come to church to be transparent, right? I'm not going to make something out and act a different way. Like, I was like, kid, like, God, you want me to prepare this message? Like, and I kept feeling like this nudge of like, you got to ask her how she's doing. I'm like, no, she's got allergies. <laughs> it's freaking, it's allergies, man. Can I give her a Claritin, God? I'll give her a Claritin, and then I'll go, I'll go to my message. It's, you, you, want, you want it to be a good message. And, uh, and so I asked her, I said, I, said, how, I said, is everything okay? And she said, no. I said, do you want to talk about it? Like, what's going on? And she said, actually, I'm flying home because my little sister just took her life. I was like, God. And so I spent that trip flying back, pulling out a seat and sitting at her table and talking about how good God is and how faithful he'll be and what I got going on in my storms. I could just see the life go back into her because I was speaking the life, God's word, over her. And, you know, and I want to thank, I want to thank you guys because there's been so many of you that the last eight weeks you you you've pulled a seat up at my table. In my hardest times, you've you've lifted up my family in prayer, you lifted up my daughter in prayer, you've you've declared truth and healing over her. And gosh, she looks so good. We'll get the report in a couple weeks, but she looks great. And I want to thank you for for taking a seat at my table in that in, the, in those valley moments. But point four is get. Get faith-filled people at your table. All right, point number five is make the next best move. So last point, 
you got to behave like God is already doing what he said he was going to do. See, while you're waiting, live in a way as if God is already doing that. Well, see, patience isn't just like sitting around. Patience is the attitude that you keep while you wait for God to come through and give the victory that he's promised you. That's patience. And see, David, in another valley moment, as Saul is in pursuit of him, again, Scripture in 1 Samuel 27 says, But David thought to himself, one of these days, David thought, he had a thought, wasn't a God thought, but it was a thought. He thought, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel, and I will slip out of his hand. See, even though Saul couldn't kill what God had crowned, David still shows that he had thoughts. And this is David that had already, had already slain the giant, right? He had already killed a bear and a lion, like, protecting sheep. This is that David. And he still thought, man, one of these days, this enemy is going to kill me, even after the promise that he knew. See, and I wonder if, if even though God's called you his child, if you've had a thought like that. Like, I can't just keep running like this. I can't just keep pretending like everything is okay. One of these days, it's going to catch up to me. See, but David didn't hold that thought. What he ended up doing is he asked himself a better question, a God question, a better question that produced a better thought. And he said, what's my next best thing I can do? See, his situation wasn't ideal. And maybe, you're, maybe your situation in a, isn't ideal either. He had been running for seven years for his life. See, it's hard to keep praising when you've been running that long, when you've been fighting the same kind of battle. He wanted to be, he wanted to be fighting alongside Saul. Worship team, if you come up. He wanted to be fighting along Saul, the Philistines. He wanted to be battling the Philistines at Saul's side. He wanted to be king. And see, some of you are waiting for different things to take place. Some of you are waiting for legal verdicts to come. Some of you are waiting to figure out, do I move or do I not move? Some of you are waiting for relationship situations. Some of you are waiting to find out what the doctor is going to say in a couple weeks. See, being seated at the table doesn't mean you're not going to have crazy thoughts. Nobody knows what you go through. Nobody knows what you push through. Nobody knows how crazy things have been. Nobody knows how, how close you've come to quitting, how much you struggle with feeling like you're enough. Nobody knows how hard it's been these past 14 months to hold on to sobriety. Nobody knows how it feels to go to work and feel undervalued and come home and feel underappreciated. Nobody knows, but he knows. He knows. See, I was laying in the, in the hospital bed. It's one of the benefits of being five foot nine. You can get into small places, you know what I mean? Praise God, all things are good. So, so Parker, you know, it's, just, it's a small bed, but I get up in there with her. And uh, she looked at me, she said, Dad, she said, Dad, I feel like, I feel scared. I said, why, sweetie? She said, I feel scared because I think I'm gonna die, Dad. And I said, I said, sweetheart, just know that if you need strength, if you need faith, I got extra for you. I got extra for you. And how much more is your father in heaven that sent his only begotten son, sinless, lived a sinless life, took on the weight of sin to die a sinner's death at a cross, to be raised from the grave, for your freedom, how much more is he going to clothe you with some extra love, with some extra mercy, with some extra goodness, with some extra kindness, with some extra comfort? See, what would you do if you knew that God was with you at your table, that he was going to do what he said he was going to do? What would be your next best move? What would the new you do, the saved you, the free you, the blessed you, See, if you knew that he prepared a table before you, 
amongst the enemy, in the presence, but at the table is him, which is his protection, his provision, his guidance, his love, his rest, the confidence, the faith, that victorious you. See, what David didn't know in that moment was that, that Saul was going to die. And, and it wasn't going to be by the sword of David. It was going to be by, by Saul's sword. Saul fell on his own sword. He fell on his own sword. In the time in the enemy territory, when David was there for 16 months, saliva running down his face, crazy, going through a very tar- hard time where he was scared, God was preparing him to conquer giants that were levels above what he could see in the moment. See, because what he didn't know was that Saul was going to die by his own sword. But what he didn't know also was that time in Philistine territory for 16 months, he was learning when they went to bed. He was learning when they woke up. He was learning what their, their tendencies were. He was learning what the enemy's weakness was. And so when he became king, what he learned in that 16-month 16 16-month trial actually prepared him when he was scared he was being prepared to not take out what God had already called done and defeated, which was Saul. It was prepare him for the victory above Saul, the next level giant, as he was equipped and trained to take out the Philistine army and have victory at a whole nother level. See, God, yeah, you might be scared, but he's preparing you, not for the, 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 the giant in front of you now, He's preparing you. That giant in his name, in his, his eyes, is defeated. He's preparing you for giants above that. That if this didn't happen, this has to happen for that victory to happen. And he's preparing you. You see, yes, I'm scared. But you're prepared. And see, God wants you to, he wants you to live in a way where you make that mm-hmm. next best move. You take the next best step. That as you look back at your life, you, you, will, you will say what David said. You'll say, man, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I lack nothing. See, I was was crushed eight weeks ago when I got that news about my daughter, when she got the diagnosis of cancer, the last day of school, the first day of summer, so much anticipation, so much expectation. We had had plans. We We wanted to go on the boat. We wanted to to have some birthday parties. We wanted to go on vacation. We, we, we had some things to do. What we didn't know was we were going to spend the first seven days in a hospital. That I was going to, that, that I was going to spend those days praying over her, proclaiming the word of God over her. That I, that I would put together this soundtrack for Parker that, of worship songs that would encourage, that would lift, that would remind us of God's goodness. That I'd go and I'd, I'd put up scriptures all over the house, so that way anytime the enemy tried to take a seat at my table, i say, you don't got a seat at my table. You don't got a seat at my table. And I would see the word of God, the truth, the freedom, all over my house. That I, we would have our family come down, and we'd play games with Parker, and we'd connect with her, that we would restart her gratitude journal with her and start going through those things. I didn't know that that's what I was going to be doing, but it was the next best thing. See, faith doesn't show you, it doesn't show you the whole staircase. It just shows you enough to take the next step. Pray for me. Hey, thanks so much for watching this message. I pray that it encouraged you. Do me one big favor. Hit that like and subscribe button. That way you can get weekly updates. Always catch these messages. And if you're in town, come visit us in person. We love you. God bless you.